Let's do this. Ready? I'm ready, girl. Oh my God, we're showing our age. Wings, girl. Wings, girl. All right. Yo. Hey, Sandra. Hey, Carrie. So, who do we interview today? Oh my gosh. I did not know him personally, one of these other ones. And I, just like Aaron Morley, I really want to be friends with this person. So inspiring. This interview blew my mind. I love this conversation. I mean, I'm so, actually, I want to go back and listen to it again because it just, it, it just uplifted me so much. So I know <laughs> this is so exciting to share with everybody. So anyway, yeah. but Michael Spires. Michael Spires, Baritenor, Baritenor Deluxe. And for those of you who do not know what a Baritenor is, listen to this interview. It Absolutely. is, but as we were doing this interview, Carrie, I, I kept on thinking, oh, that little snippet that he said, oh my gosh, that's like priceless information. Oh no, but then this snippet, it is information for young artists, people who love opera. It, it's very detailed information about our business yeah. and his journey in this business. I mean, um, and I loved the way he looks at it. Uh, we were just talking about this uh, privately, but the lens in which he looks at this business and is such a positive one that, and I, you know, that he really means it and it's very sincere. And I think he walks and lives this, that I, it really just, uh, even for people where we, for us, for us, where we are in our careers, this was an uplifting conversation. So, I mean, I think we need all the uplifting. We can get people. Humbling. It was very humbling and, and make sure you listen to what he did during the pandemic. Oh, I mean, priceless. <laughs> So check out this clip. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget, seriously, more content, subscribe, people. Just subscribe. click the button. It's so easy I to do. Where it is, wherever the button is, just subscribe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Love y'all. Bye. You know, no one's going to give you a career. And people think that like, man, if I just, if I get this one role in this house, I'm going to make it. Like, no, no, you aren't. You have to make it continuously yeah. for years and years and years and years. We hear you, but if we don't see you. And now oh, we see you and hear you. Oh, yeah. Merlot. Merlot. Oh, no. Chardonnay. You, you guys should start saying that. Chardonnay or Merlot. Merlot. Um, yeah. Chardonnay. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. Very good. As you can oh. see, you know, I'm in my best Jimmy Buffett wear. You know? <laughs> we got dressed up for us. Yay. Margaritaville. Did, <laughs> did we see did we see a drink or are you working? What, what, can it be both? <laughs> yes. Yes, it can. Now that is the best attitude yet. Cheers. Yes. <laughs> Cheers to you as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining the shenanigans. Thank you. Shen shenanigans. I'm always up for shenanigans. We like shenanigans. Mm. We've, we've, we've not had many opportunities for shenanigans and hopefully <laughs> we, will, we will have more opportunities for shenanigans yeah, in person. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Absolutely. Mo, mo that was very nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Carrie's there. <laughs> Carrie's got, she's got that. But you're sounding very tenor like today. Very tenor. Yeah, yeah. I've been singing uh, quite a few hours. I was I was singing the through Trojans that I'm singing next and then Handel as well. So it's very dichotomy of singing like super low and super high. You that, know? Oh, that's like <laughs> that's like bonk bonk. I can't yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. That's just kind of my thing. Okay. All right. All right. So okay. Okay. That's better. That better? Maybe this is better. That better? That's better. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. uh. Um, um, um. There we go. Okay. Are you happy, are you happy with your screenshot? <laughs> my my setup. I'm your just setup. trying to get lighting, lighting, lighting. Mm. You know how it is. Oh, oh yes. Gotta, oh, I love the get lighting. My best side. All my side. All things. Okay, good. Especially all right. When you're I think that's road. Is that good? You're happy with that? I think we're good. All right. That, Cheers. I don't know. It sounds, sounds like I'm. I shouldn't be. You're like. You're happy with that? <laughs> <laughs>
I'm sorry. Idiot. You're happy I'm with it. Fair enough. Okay. Today, like resting <laughs> bitch, like, oh, you're happy with it? Oh, like you're. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah, where are good. where are you? What's happening? What are you doing in your life right now? Um, lots of things. Well, actually, I'm I'm in Munich. It's been an amazing thing. I'm doing um the uh, uh Bayerischer Staatsoper. We're doing the festival um starting in three weeks. I think we open. Um, we're doing Handel's Semele. Really, really wonderful cast. And uh, Klaus Gut is the director. And it's one of, to be honest, it's one of the easiest jobs I've ever had in my life it's awesome i mean like i'm basically just you know it's handle it's great so i sing like four or five arias i just pop in for three minutes and then i just hang out backstage and everyone else has to be on stage all all day so i'm just kind of like hanging out lounge, lounging so, i love that yeah. you know um <laughs> the role of all the jesus like that it's like uh once she's i know done, i know exactly and, what you're talking about yeah, yeah. you're like back there like <laughs> hey norma i got my margarita <laughs> I know, and Norma's meanwhile just like dying every scene because it's it's insanity. Ugh. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's so fun. That's amazing. Like, oh, after another home. Oh, yeah, no. yeah. Oh. Bring it's that mic to... away. I know. Her... That is why I don't sing her no more. <laughs> no more. No more. No more. No more. Life is too short for those long operas. I mean, yeah, <laughs> cheers to that. You know, turned out without the ending, the turned out at Liu's death, best gig ever <laughs> i think you're minutes, on stage about 30 minutes as turandot right it's like it's it's not that long of a role is it about 30 oh, minutes but then like but then stopping it at where puccini stopped the oh, opera okay. yeah you're 18 just like minutes. Peace out. oh are you serious i counted it i counted it yes i did the next it's thing i'm gonna done. do is like money per note yeah How much? <laughs> But I gotta say, we we you know I always use as a reference the the one uh, show that we were supposed to do um, uh, that got canceled in in Paris. Um, I got paid more money per note than I've ever because we they paid us out. Do you remember it was for the strikes? Is right before COVID. They paid yeah. us out and we didn't sing a note. And so I'm just like, so that's my reference per note. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but that was so stressful. I mean, the amount of stress. yeah, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, because Carrie, that was in Paris. Remember all those strikes and then yeah. and then the, the the transit strike and then yeah. and we didn't know from day to day and we wouldn't find out until like five o'clock for a seven o'clock show if it was going to go yeah. on or not. And I mean, so you had and to the course the day, came like, 10, 15 minutes later because they were negotiating. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Welcome to Paris. But yep that was that was an exp you know that's one for the books right you know uh -huh. anyway so, you, so wait, you you talked about Tryon too they try out yes yes i'm getting ready to, after after this is done i have about a week at home and then i do a big tour uh, uh with john elliott gardner um doing salzburg festival berlin uh uh, Coven, or and not Coven Gardner, uh, uh the royal uh albert hall and uh the Berlioz Festival, so it'll it'll be a heck of a, a tour. I think six different performances all around, and Versailles as well. So Whoa. yeah, Trojans on tour, which crazy, Whoa. yeah, yeah, yeah. So is your family with you or no? The, my family will be here in uh, in next week. Actually, they'll be here for uh, for a whole month. So usually, how it happens is that I'll I'll come and then do the intense rehearsals and kind of get used to the character, and then they come towards the end of rehearsals and then um, during the performances when we have a little bit more time off. You know, it's a slightly different schedule. Uh, so, um, I I mean, I read that uh, you're married and you have two boys. Yeah. Uh, what are the ages of your boys? nine and seven years old oh, two boys and they're both crazy and so, you, you have children as well no 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 kids uh husband um and, okay. and until recently i had a very a 200 pound uh fur child named humphrey but we lost him about a month ago so he was oh he, i'm like, sorry like, what was it pyrenees big. or or a, no, a big saint bernard 200 oh, pounds saint bernard pounds. okay mm -hmm. i have a mastiff at home we he's about 175 pounds Amazing. yeah um, and i'm the only one like 
to take him to the vet, I have to pick him up because my brother weighs about the same 175. So you just like, Arr! so I pick him up and throw him in my truck because he doesn't want to move. But, yep. you know, yeah. They're oh, the yeah. best. They're, and they're the best they're with amazing. kids. I grew up with Mastiffs in St. Bernard. So oh, wow. I love them. They're so awesome with kids. Um, so then where is home home? Where is this yeah. Mastiff and the family? Um, just outside of Springfield, Missouri. Yeah. Where oh. I grew up. Um, so oh, Southwest Missouri. Okay. And um, it's a great it's a great hub for me because I, it's very uh, close to where I was born, about 30 minutes from where I was born. But Springfield is kind of this uh, interesting little Midwest hub because three um, three Fortune 300 companies are in Springfield. So we have awesome uh, connections to, to Atlanta, Denver, uh, Chicago. Every hour there's multiple flights. Um, and so I'm like, I'm, I, I can literally get to London faster than my friends who live in Sicily uh, from Missouri. <laughs> I, I fly to fly to Chicago and then Chicago, London. Yeah. That's so it's a, it's a great little hub. It's only 30 minute uh, drive from my house. So like oh. door to door. Yeah. And it's a smaller airport that's easy to get through security. So everybody knows oh. me there. Thank yeah. God. I mean, oof, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Are you, are you singing more in Europe now? Or, I mean, I know, I know you were just at the I Met. Pretty much always, I, yeah, I have the last, I mean, because I moved over here, let's see, in 2003. Um, I moved over to Europe in, in Austria. And for the last, yeah, 21 years, um, I, I would say I spend about seven, eight months here in Europe. Uh, wow. And, I mean, I, I rarely, uh, I rarely sing the, the, in the States, you know, because I, I did all of my... Uh, formative years in my mid 20s and my uh, mid 30s all here in Europe so I've sung in all the places there but I'm now just starting to sing in the states a little bit more um so yeah which is good it's good for me because I think if I would have sung in the larger houses um the Met and things like that it would have it would have been not so good for the development of my voice um because people still have no idea what to do with my voice people some people think that I'm like a a light lyric uh Rossini and then other people when they hear me they're like holy moly that's a Wagner voice I'm like yeah it can be both I promise yep. <laughs> you just just depends on the rep you know well so. I find in in North America that um, if you don't fit into a box, if your voice doesn't fit into that category, that they yeah. don't know what to do with you. Oh, and for sure, for sure. I you, feel that's like everywhere. I don't know if that's, I don't know. What do you think, Michael? Do you think that's all everywhere? I think it's particular, I, I think it's particularly a, a physics uh, thing in the United States because you do have to have um, a substantial pipes to be able to sing in the larger houses in the states right. comparatively i mean like even where i'm from we the the opera uh company that i run um we're in a we're in a smaller house in the states you know and it seats like 1300 people and that's a medium size you know and we also have another place where we've done operas in our town of springfield which is 3500 people so you just don't have that ability in in europe uh and so you you start to end up singing in a slightly different different way in the states just because of sheer physics and the vocal form and of getting through the orchestra in a large place that was never meant for opera so right. so yeah i do i do find that um that that there is a specific hurdle that you have to get over in the states um uh to have a sizable uh, voice to be able to be heard in larger larger places but um you you have the same you have the same in the states but because they have more repertoire uh variation within the uh within the the houses in europe more people have more of a fighting chance to be able to find their way in europe to be honest and that's why i moved because when i first started singing and auditioning when i was 21 they were asking me you know like where's your puccini where's your verdi and i'm like i'm 21 I want to sing weird <laughs> stuff like Bellini and Meyerbeer and right. Aubert. And they're like, I've heard of that person, but you're not going to make a career. And I was like, well, uh, how can I make a career in the next 15 years until my voice is ready? So I, I moved to Europe um, and that's how I started learning languages and, you know, going up through the ranks. So it's, it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And people call you an overnight success now in the in the U.S. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's what I love is that it takes 15 years to be an overnight success. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> That's a well, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, being a baritoner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I mean, how do you define it? And have you yeah. always been a baritoner? 
Yeah, I would say, uh, I would say definitely. I mean, as my, as my voice has gotten older, it's gotten progressively darker. And now that I'm in my mid forties, um, the calcification process happens. And for those who don't know, that is when basically you're, you know, it's, it's male going through the change in the mail, um, in the early forties, um, you're, you're, uh, you start going through this process to where your your bones harden and your your cartilage hardens, and then you're you're having a a, a, a little bit of darker tone um, as you get into your forties, and, and it happens also with women as well. Um, but uh, it's very noticeable in the male uh, voice range, and in the last few years, it's been a huge change, um, just darkening wise. But um, when I started out. You know, I was a natural lyric baritone, and it was, you know, the first arias I ever learned were like, uh, you know, um, from uh, Don Giovanni. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And my speaking voice, um, you know, I, I had an abnormally low speaking voice because I would, you know, do the like, oh, I'm a, you know, uh, baritone. Uh, and I was like, no. And then I had this voice teacher for a year and a half. You you might know him. He still, I, I don't think he teaches anymore, but he still does. Um, uh, his name is Robert Mershak, Mershak artist. Oh, yeah. um, but he was, he was like an older brother to me. And he was my, my only teacher for a year and well, two years um, in my undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And he's a natural tenor. Um, and he was like, ah, I think you could be a tenor. And I was like, what are you talking about? Listen you sound to my voice. just like him. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but literally, you know, I, I wake up every single day and I sing low C's. And and when I'm really, really singing, um, yeah. like until I've warmed up, I mean, I'm I'm singing A flats down in the like bass, bass range. So no one knew what to do with me. Um, yeah. And I didn't either. But I kept reading about, I kept reading about uh, dramatic tenors, how they'll only start to really hit their peak in their mid 40s. And that's when um, that's when you can have a career. But I was like 21, and I was like, "So what do I do for 23 years?" You know, <laughs> like. And um, so I did a mixture of a couple of different baritone roles. About I've done eight baritone roles when I started out, and then I started to find my way within uh, Rossini. Actually, back in the uh, mid 20s, uh, doing this weird category, which I found out um, later that. It, it really isn't as, as uh, bizarre as a lot of people make it out to be this baritone category because the, the male and female voices throughout, throughout history until basically the Fox system came about in the mid 1800s, everyone was switching back and forth. And that's why you, would, you, you, know, you, would, you didn't have these strict ideas of soprano or mezzo or dramatic soprano. And you know, it was how, depending on the house, depending on your technique and your proclivities as a person and an actress, uh, mm -hmm. actor. Um, and so I always went back and forth. And to be honest, how I started out, I, I, I come from a really musical family. My sister's a, a musical theater uh, singer. She's a Broadway actress and singer. Mm -hmm. And my brother also, uh, he's, he's always been like me. We've sung in four different countries together. And both of my parents, uh, music, music teachers and my father was the choir conductor in the in in church and to be honest where i really got my my bearings for for my voice was was in church because i would get so bored singing singing baritone and bass and just like bah, 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 yeah. bah, bah. so i would jump around <laughs> I want the melody <laughs> yeah i would jump around to tenor jump to alto and then start singing falsetto and the soprano and uh yeah it was just it would that that was how i started to realize this range but as i've, I've told a few people my biggest thing what i wanted to do was uh would be Mel Blanc, who was a voice, uh, voice uh, actor um, who did all of the voices of uh, Bugs Bunny and like everything from the Looney Tunes. A lot of people don't realize still that it was one person that did every single voice from the Looney Tunes. Mm. And that was my dream. You know, I sent in uh, sent in CDs and um, no tapes at the time. That's what it was. I sent in tapes to a cartoon network. I mean, um, yep. back, back in the uh, um, mid nineties uh, to try to try to get into voice acting, you know, and um, that's how I've always just uh, kind of felt uh, more, more comfortable is kind of faking sounds. And then when someone told, you know, when Robert uh, Murphy told me to be a, be a tenor, I was like, 
okay. And then I would listen to people like UC Bierling and I would come and like, it's like, oh, you were listening to Bierling this week. That's great. <laughs> That's not your voice. Right. Like, you oh, have crap. an amazing ear. I will say you can yeah. imitate <laughs> Yeah, anything. really spectacular. Well, oh, thank you. But that's what I love doing. And then uh, it took me like 10 years to get away from that, to find my actual voice. And the mm -hmm. only thing that that worked to be able to find this kind of straddling register was Rossini, um, specifically baritenor uh, arias and uh, operas written for people like Andrea Nozzari, who was uh, 13, I've done now 13 uh, Rossini operas, but eight Nozzari roles. So he was the typical baritoner and he was Rossini's Otello. So in, in Otello, um, along with Armida and a few other ones, there is no, there's no baritone whatsoever. There's six tenors. So that gives you an idea how, how weird the, the categorization of tenor is because there's literally a bass and then six different tenors, different timbres of tenor. And tenor and baritone, for the most part, um, until the mid 1800s, were synonymous with either or. You know, you had the first exception of the person that a lot of people say, the baritone Martin, um, who was in the late 1700s, uh, early 1800s. But you also had like people that uh, there's the really wonderful. Uh, um, he was a singer that started out as a male soprano. Then when he made his debut, he was a, a, a tenor. Um, uh, uh, so Sole, uh, I think is his name, um, back in like 1815, I think is when he, um, finished, but like he started as a male soprano, then made his career debut as a tenor. Then as he got older in his forties, sang baritone, then he ended his career in his late fifties as a bass. So, um, you know, you and you and you have people like Liza Cannell, you know, Elizabeth Cannell, who was one of the greatest dramatic sopranos ended up, but she started out as a contralto, you know, and if you listen right. to her singing and she went up, you know, so it all depends on the voice and how how you feel it. But for the most part, I think everyone has more flexibility and possibility, but we, we get into these um, these kind of uh, mental ruts to to make us realize that like. But yeah, my voice can only do this. And you're like, well, well but I, also, yeah. I also think that mm. it's in dance too. It's people that run the theater. For sure. Because I, I mean, sure. in my own career, I went from mezzo to soprano. I think I'm really yeah. a transition to be quite honest. And and I can bring all of the, like you, I can bring all of these different boxes to the table. But yeah. it was really confusing for a lot of people. And it was really difficult auditioning because you go, what do I actually put? I can do Rossini to Puccini. What yep. do I, and, and honestly, like with management, everybody, they said, well, we just need to focus this and let's just focus <laughs> on this one thing. So my question to you, especially for young singers that would be listening to you, yeah, how, like when you went to audition, did you just audition as baritone at first? Where, where was the change when you said, I'm going to propose this to these people and hopefully they'll buy it. Cause honestly, I think people are so afraid of something new yeah. and are confused by it. So then yeah. what's your advice to young singers? Oh, well, exactly. And that's exactly how I was too. When I moved to Europe at 23, I had a very shaky tenor. And so I started auditioning with the, the tenor roles that, um, that don't go above an A flat. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like uh, uh, uh -huh. Traviata and Linsky and all doing all these arias, but inevitably someone was like, Oh, that's a beautiful tone. Now let's hear you sing a high C. And it was like, ah, oh, oh, no, can't do it. I turn into Mickey Mouse. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> and um, so what, what was weird to me is like for five years, everyone said, okay, at 23, I moved over and they said, you're going to find work. You're a young, you know, uh, young tenor. You're going to find work. It took four and a half years of nonstop auditions to get no work. <laughs> I auditioned probably 30 to 60 times on my own, not having agents and stuff, got nothing, but I literally sustained myself through singing in choirs. Oh, and I would I, I wanted I to sang, know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I sang I sang in the Schoenberg Chor, which is uh um known for being this straight tone like oh yeah. and uh, which is not my thing, uh, but I had to learn and adapt. But the great thing that, that it did it was it um, it allowed me to uh, to really work my technique because in order to sing four to six hours in a choir setting, yeah, 
you got to have technique. Yeah. And and I got to sing I got to sing on stage in the chorus, you know, and really sing operatically with some of the greatest singers. You know, this is back uh, 20 years ago. And when I was first starting out, um, I, I got to watch these great singers and go, hmm, oh, oh, uh, uh, oh, oh, that's what they're doing. And how are they projecting? OK, that's great. I had real time ability to watch watch them. And when I when I was auditioning, I like I said, I was auditioning as a typical tenor, okay. you know, and everywhere I went, everyone had no clue what to do with me. I auditioned in Germany and they were like, your voice is too big for, for Mozart and Rossini. You should be singing, uh, you know, the, you know, Strauss, Wagner, Puccini. And I was like, okay. And then I would go to Italy and they're like, no, 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 no. You, 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 you should be doing uh, Mozart and Rossini. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> had a clue. Nobody had a clue. And then Austria, you know, that was the interesting thing is that I just started having to adapt and be a chameleon. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. they're not hiring me for this. What can I get work for? Oh, right. operetta and these kind of middle things I would do. I mean, I did everything like that besides choirs. I was, you know, they have the, the tourist uh, uh, concerts for people in Vienna. Mm -hmm. that Like big tours come through for years. That's what I did. I'd wear, wear a fake Mozart wig and, you know, have my uh -huh. gut hanging out with a bad Mozart outfit. <sighs> And, you know, people would come up and like, you were very good. It was pretty amazing. It was like, oh, thank you. And like, wow, you speak English well. It's like, yeah, I'm from Missouri. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So for years, that's what I did to make money. $50 for singing, you know, eight arias, you know. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Things have changed. But no. yeah. so did you have a manager then? And did you have to convince a manager that this is what I want to do? That's the funny thing is, yeah, and in, in, in Europe and most of Europe, you don't have to be exclusive to a manager. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in Vienna, um, I had uh, at one time four different managers um, for, for about a period of two years, and they got me no auditions, all four of them. Um, the only auditions that I got were the ones that I got myself um, through, through word of mouth and other friends and people. So, <clears throat> you know, I mean and i'm i'm sure it's not gotten any better <laughs> a lot of our a lot of our careers and a lot of younger people need to realize that um your career really really i mean it's great when you have a great manager but mm -hmm. your career is is dependent on you and what you how you figure out how to fit into this world it's a very weird world and there's no cookie cutter image and that's why it's so frustrating where where you're saying that like intendants can't quite fit you and what i try to tell everybody is to to make them realize that there's a virtue in being an outsider you know if you're if you're one of those that makes it in you know like you're a puccini singer you're puccini and you get right. work awesome you fit in the system that's fantastic mm -hmm. good for you but uh, if you're like most other people and you can't find a way, you're going to have to do something alternatively. Um, and so what I started to do, um, and this was back in, gosh, what is it, 2006, 2007, I was looking at festivals and um, obscure uh, labels and writing to them via email and saying, you know, I have this uh, kind of voice a little bit like Chris Merritt or um, uh, uh, it, that's kind of baritone and I can move it like Rossini so would you be interested in hearing me and so I got to sing for the right people and um, that's what really launched my career in 2008 was uh, doing Otello for the first time. Rossini Otello. Rossini's Otello yeah. So exactly. you you just kind of took the bull by the horns and in yeah. essence put yourself in a really vulnerable position and just wrote to people and said hey yeah and you yeah. were just kind of like throwing it. Am I right with this? Like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks and say. Um, what I still do. Look at my career. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's my next question. I was really curious, you know, do you still, um, is the ball still in your hands with your career or do you let your manager that you have now help out with all of that? That's, that's a really good um, uh, point to make because I, after having those four managers, I didn't, I, I was just like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to do this all myself. But then um, mm -hmm. I found who is currently my manager. His name's uh, Helmut Fisher, and he's one of my best friends. And we, he, I was his second client, um, and um, I helped him, and he helped me for the last 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. We've 
built strategically and we talk every day like more than my you know i mean if you have a good really good relationship with your manager and um it's it's very much a relationship you know i talk to him more than i do anyone else in the world basically but and we don't always get along you know <laughs> but we right. all have a we have a, a common goal and he and i have we've really we've really kind of crafted because i have a million ideas and as you can notice i don't shut up much uh, when i'm I on it. i love it uh, you're making our job easy <laughs> so easy thank you <laughs> when, I, when i when i'm on but um so he's more like hmm those are five ideas one of those is good uh and i was like all right fair enough which is which is the one mm -hmm. it's like okay we'll go in this direction i know this person here i know that person there let's start looking at the calendar and we really strategically look at it like that but and he believes um, in you. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That, exactly. That is the, in my opinion, with a manager is the biggest thing. It, you don't have to be with the biggest company. No. It's like a marriage. You have to have a relationship and they have to believe in your talent. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the interesting thing is that um, a lot of people uh, think that they have to be with a specific um, uh, big agency or something. And, and, it's good if it works for you. Just like if you're in the if you're in the 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 in the club in the Puccini Club or the Verdi Club, great. That works for you. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. But but don't expect uh, those who aren't getting the work that if I get with Cami or if I get with I don't even know if Cami's around anymore. No. I guess. <laughs> well, I remember back. You know, you you and I we we've all been in the business long enough that it's like we've seen these big companies rise and fall, and we've seen small right. ones grow bigger. And then fall as well. So it's it's uh it's unfortunately um it I would say not necessarily a winner take all game, but but it is pretty cutthroat. And many people don't realize that um, if you don't have a manager that's going to fight for you in a large agency, um, you're going to be just as lost and sometimes buried just as much. And I have I've had friends that that were with big um, you know big agencies, but they're you know, a soprano and they're one of 20 sopranos and they're, they're not, they're not able to stand out even within their own agents, uh, you know, agency. So I think it, uh, there, there is no one specific uh, thing, but I think people need to be realistic about the, uh, about the opportunities that uh, a specific uh, agent can do for yeah. you. Because for instance, there's, there's some of uh, the greatest, greatest agents out there in the world. Um, but it could be that one house that you really want to sing in, they don't like your agent. They don't like the the way that they look. They don't like how they had interacted in the past and you'll never sing there, right. you know? Um, and I, I mean, I have friends that, uh, you know, they they wanted to sing in, uh, you know, Schatz over in Wien, but their agent just didn't have an in in there. And you can be really famous and still not be able to get into a house. And people don't realize that there's, a territorial there's a cultural thing there's a there's a personal uh thing in order to make a career it's there's so many all of these things uh these stacks that you have to have in order to make career you can't you can't just be that you're the greatest voice or the greatest uh um actress you know not everybody wants that everyone is different and uh in, that, that blows my yeah. mind i mean i just why not open your doors and hear what the world yep. has to offer you singer wise and then get these people on your stages. I mean, everybody's complaining yep. about well, operas dying or whatever. Well, the, where are the, I mean, you're not, you're not opening yourself up to a world of opportunity and talent. And I, yep. I mean, as we all know, and Sandra and I've said a million times, you've got the talent on the stage and the magic sauce and the seats fill up magically they fill up when you put on a good show so yeah. I, this is what blows my mind i just don't understand why it's so political as far as that's concerned it's ridiculous well and yeah i know um oh sorry go ahead no 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 go i was just going to say that one of the biggest things that i've been able to have insight into that a lot of singers haven't is that i'm an administrator as well because i'm a, um i'm the yes. artistic director of the ozarks lyric opera and cool. my whole understanding of the entire business changed once i took that position over because i had no clue what i was doing okay. but i knew that the the company that um that uh that i'm the artistic director of i i knew that 
that's where I got my start. I started out when I was 18 uh, doing um, chorus work. And then my first role when I was 19, you know, I was Don Curzio and um, awesome. in Leno City Figaro. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to do, you know, with this small regional company, I did seven roles by the time I was 21, which um, mm -hmm. most of my friends and people that grew up in the States, they have none of those opportunities. Like Indiana universities, like that's their one thing that they've ever gotten to do. Maybe like second, you know, yeah, it's Saitadama. And then they go and do auditions and they're 23, 24. And they're like, yeah. so where's your experience? And like, well, I did this master class, you know? So the reason that I got into the, uh, to the regional um, position um, of being the artistic director is it was like almost every, um, every place in the States, uh, it was folding. And I just thought if any of these kids ever want to have any kind of chance, because we have no places within four hours of uh, drive oh, to wow. have, a, have any kind of uh, um, opera opportunity okay. to even see opera. So I was just like, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to learn what this is, you know, how to be a director uh, of, of this opera company. And I'll do it for free because I know you have no money. So that's what I did. And I just, uh, I still, it's been eight years now and, Sometimes I want to pull my hair out, but you know, I do it, I do it all for free because I care about it so much. And this is the way that I can give back and kind of show people that opera is relevant and it's changed my life. And that's one of the, the great things that I do. And to, to circle back around why I, why I see things differently, because as an administrator, you start to see, you start to see how, um, how things do become a commodity and what, what things you can do and especially in the states and the europe are totally different things i mean really like i would say the midwest and the the coasts are completely different worlds as well really? uh, when we're talking about um opera companies um mm -hmm. and budgets even even budgets from from my opera company to to say tulsa or or wichita or any of these were miles away um from any kind of differences because of corporate donors and because of uh specific uh, um companies that uh that are willing to give and in my area we have some companies but no big donors whatsoever it's all it's all like you know bubblegum donors like you know when you when you go to and we're able to and we're one of the older ones that are still in in business 45 years now um almost <laughs> And um, we're, we're, we're doing better than ever. That's a great thing. Um, uh, and uh, I've been able to get friends from, from the business, from, from around to, to come for very, very cheap. But I show them a good time and put them up in a really great hotel and cool. barbecue and have beers yeah. and stuff. So, so you make it um, fun. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Make it fun. But to, to get back to the, to the nuts and bolts of it, um, the hard thing is, is that when you start to say it's, um, yes, it'd be great if we could put this on and do a great, great opera and the audience would come. Um, I do, I do find that that, that is the case in certain areas, but every single area is different because, um, we have a we have a very different demographic than so we have we have about um uh half younger people and um, first timers to come to the opera and then half older people and they're the donors um and most of our donors are um dying out and the, they're they're the older older crowd so everyone's having to go through this kind of shift to try to get the younger generation um to try to figure out how to get pe people in the seats and so that's why you're seeing a lot of transition and a lot of changes and I would love if you can have this kind of uh, more traditional uh, way of looking at uh, at opera, but uh, even in even in Europe, they're having they're having uh, problems with that. But like in Europe, they're ninety, let's say eighty eight to they, they can be anywhere from a budget from eighty eight percent up to ninety six, ninety seven percent government funded. Right. Um, and uh, with us, uh, I think the most we've ever done is like 9% uh, we've gotten for a government um, funding. Um, and uh, most of that is every, every penny has to be uh, given to, um, to outreach or a specific project for, which is great. That's what opera is in our area. But, but what, what I mean to say is to, to um, when, when it comes to the larger companies, Everyone is a case by case basis, uh, and and no, just like voices, 
it's all it's all trying to figure out what works in your area. Sometimes it's mismanagement, but mm-hmm. a lot of times it comes down to um, literally a lot of singers would would understand um, why the state of the the opera world is the way that it is if they start looking at the actual numbers and realize like oh my gosh everybody's everybody's working on a on a deficit mm-hmm. all of the time i mean that's what literally you know one of the great uh, uh examples for me and, and a great mentor for me is patrick summers in, in houston and we talk sometimes about it and uh one of the things he tells people is that you have to realize it's in it's in your uh, it's in your name you're a nonprofit you're not going to be profiting. And the problem is is that everybody tries to run a nonprofit as a profit business. Uh So what a nonprofit actually is and what it has to be is managing the uh, loss and and trying to figure out how you can actually put something on for as cheap as possible. Mm-hmm. And it sounds crazy, but it's we we turn into commodities, and I hate that that it, that it is. But mm-hmm. but to go back to what you were saying about like how like I wish it was like the way that was, and the opera is dying. Anyone who's saying that um, doesn't actually know the numbers, and they don't actually know anything about the history of opera. Because in what I say that is that um, think about when we say the heyday of opera, you know, I would say the the fifties and the sixties, you know, everyone's like, wow. Mm-hmm. But do you realize how few singers there were? There were of course a lot of famous, uh, famous singers, right. but um, you had a lot of people that were in active war and a lot, lot less singers that had, a, um, you know what I mean? Like we, we had right. a lot of years of people in wars and very, very few uh, singers, but you had lots less houses. And if you look at the rate of regional and smaller companies that have, have, that have blossomed right. in the last 50 years, right. it's amazing. So there's more opera going on than there ever has been. Right. It's just more spread out and it's in smaller scale. Right. And the problem is, is that everyone thinks that there was this wonderful heyday like yes there was for a very tiny minority is that what you want it to go back to or do you want opera for all do you want it for everyone you know and this is this is the thing that we all have to keep in mind because like man i wish i could have been in the 60s like oh okay so you would have you 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 want the world to go back to this tiny little elitist organization no problem we could do that you know and i mean some and, and in some aspects it's kind of what's happening now because because certain companies um, are are able to uh, to get the corporate money and and know yeah. exactly how to how to rig the system. So, so do, you, <laughs> do you see yourself moving further in that direction of managing an opera company? I don't like know. I mean, I would company? I would always love I I love being a part of it now. And the the funny thing is that my my career about eight years ago kind of took a. Um, took a, uh, a, a neat little turn because of this. And now when I go to an opera company, I can literally talk to the admin in a completely different way because I have to hire people. I have to fire them. I know what 51C3s and I know how to file 990s and all of these kind of stupid right. things that we have to do as administrators. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know about fundraising. I know about how to how to woo people um, and, and figure out you know how to how to target people mm-hmm. um for for funds and how to do it in the right way you know but um it's an I, art I asking it, for money yeah it is yeah. an art yeah oh, i know I, well, I i i suck at it i just tell them my story and then they're like wow that's great you know okay. <laughs> i i don't like to ever ask but then the biggest things that you have to start to realize like you're not asking for money you're asking for an idea for the organization and yeah. if you believe in it they will believe it you yeah. know they will believe in it and if you have the you have the history to back it up, that's the great thing. Because like when we started eight years ago, um, um, when I took over, we were literally like you know 50, 60 in debt, and now our and and I think our overall operating budget was something about eighty thousand for the year. Um, and now we've um, we're up to about three fifty, which in eight years, cool. you know, that's like four times the size yeah. of it. And, and the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the pandemic. Yeah. And it's mainly because, to be honest, like I said, I'll do, I'll do things for free, but my wife and my brother and my whole family, like we put on shows for free. <laughs> I, yeah. that's, I love I, that. 
we applaud you yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, but we really that. care. We really, really care. And it's on a different level than than the, the bigger world. But like I say that um I do find myself wanting to 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 help more in that in that aspect. And and to be honest, like one of the people that um because of the, the scandal in the last years, you know, Domingo has gotten um um rightfully so some some bad press in some ways, but we have to remember that um, one of the big reasons that opera um, is still in existence in the way in that way is because of people like him and because of Renee Fleming and because of Cecilia Bartoli. These really, really people that have taken over administrative positions and really have been the beacon for um, opera and people like you too, Sandra. I mean, like what you're able to do and go around to like larger places and 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 you know like with the, your your queens uh um right. when you when you did that tour that's the kind of big thinking opera that needs to happen in order to um to shine the brightest light so people can people can have something to look up to and then it goes all the way down to to companies even smaller than mine that aren't able to put on right. full full operas but we're all part of the same the same structure and and we need to realize that um we're all playing the same game here, you know, and um, I, I really, really applaud anyone who um, who is a younger singer that wants to learn uh, administrative, uh, um, because if you really want to be a change in the system, um, you have to be a part of it and you have to understand mm -hmm. the lingo and you have to mm -hmm. learn how to talk to people. And going back to like what you were talking about, how how was it when I was starting out, how did I get jobs? Well, I, I was frustrated because I would go and do an audition and I only spoke English. and um, you know, uh, 20, 23, I could, you know, I could kind of fake some German phrases when I moved there, yeah. but not really. Mm -hmm. But then it took six to eight months. And then I started being able to con uh, converse in German. And then a year later, I was uh, pretty, pretty well that I could do any audition in German. Cool. And then the same thing happened when I started singing in Italy, I couldn't uh, do auditions in Italian. Yeah. But then working there a few times, then I spoke Italian, same in French. You know, and so it just is a learning process, but you just can't you give up. You worked hard. I'm sorry, yeah. but let's yeah. let's let's call. Yeah, I'm a little crazy. <laughs> you you you're really hardworking. I mean, you. I know this about you that you <laughs> you learn music very quickly too, which is a, a yeah. gift. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I had to learn. I had to learn how to do it because, like I said, um, I wasn't able to get regular work uh being a specific kind of a singer so mm -hmm. i just said yes to everything and that meant i had to learn everything uh, <laughs> and i had to figure out a way to learn everything and so i had to start doing things which i since found out is a is actually a really good cognitive hack it's called spaced repetition learning and one of the best ways for our uh for our brains to memorize things in the long term is to do intense spurts of it and then putting it away Hmm. Then coming back a couple of weeks later, looking at it in a different light, then putting it away, you know, and now typically, I mean, there for a while, it was crazy. I was doing uh, uh, six to eight new operas per year, plus like 10 concerts. Um, so now I know it's, it's insane. It's insane. So, and as a, as a parent of two and traveling crazily, my, my memorization is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> oh, wait um, until you're 54. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's like, nope, not, not happening. Because I mean, like in, in my late 30s, that's when I started noticing a slight change because I was in Paris at the Opera Comique. And that year I had done four operas, um, four different operas um, with the same uh, librettist, uh, Eugène Scribe. Um, and it was a uh, Meyerbeer and Aubert uh, uh, and then, uh, gosh, a Gounod as well. Uh, and I was in, I was in this, uh, opera comique where I've sung many times and I started to uh, uh, sing in different because uh, they're the same word patterns that he always used as a librettist mm -hmm. I was just singing different operas in the middle and they're like that's not right I was like what what I was just I was singing it it's like that's the wrong opera it's like oh shit <laughs> I did my brain is going crazy queens. in the three yeah. queens um poor Ricardo Fries said the conductor um I was doing in one of the performances, I did the cadenza from one of the other operas. <laughs> yeah. And I was oh, like, yeah, yeah. what? Like... It goes up, it goes down. <laughs> it's the cadenza. And he's like, Sandra, you are very blonde. I said, oh, I mean, three operas in your You're head. like, I've got hair. No. 
<laughs> I that would have been a good comeback to Ricardo. <laughs> exactly. But it was, you know, it's 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 difficult. And and oh, yeah. I, we both yeah. applaud you for that. I mean, gee. Oh, thank you. Well, in Bel Canto, you know, there's so many of the same patterns and um that you just start you start, you know, whipping off that's that's what it is. The you're your brain goes in a different direction. You can't remember. Uh oh, where where you know, am I? You're riffing. You're riffing in 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 bel canto style. That's what I'm <laughs> exactly. Like. Exactly. Okay, well, you know, I'm just it, nobody knew except the conductor. And sadly, yeah. the conductor needed that point to bring in the orchestra. I was like, you know, you know, Whoop. one time I was doing uh, uh, Guillaume Tell in uh, Bologna. This is years ago, and it was uh, um, uh, conductor. Um, uh, uh, let me think, um, Mariotti, and oh. uh, and he and I go way back. But it was funny because I was singing and uh, and singing uh, the the main aria of uh, Arnold, and I kept switching back into Italian because I had sung that like two weeks before in Italian um, uh, for for a concert, uh, and you know in the middle of re rehearsals or the final dress, he was like, Francese. Francese, you know, you just meet them. It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, not Italian. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> oh my god. I... Yeah, you have to be a little crazy to be in this business. Yeah, just a small, just a smidge. Smidge, just, just a hurt. smidge. Um. Okay, so as I'm listening to this and all the things that are on your plate, how in the world are you balancing a career, a marriage? a fatherhood like balance how i mean have you found the magic sauce for that or se secret recipe for that at times yes at times yes but at times no i mean it's you know to be honest just like everybody it's any kind of relationship is a difficulty and um and especially being a being a dad and the fortunate thing that i have is that i do have enough work and almost too much work so i can say yes or or um or not to yeah. to something nowadays, um, and I've I've set myself up in the last year to to have connections in every single country, so I know different schedules of like okay, my kids are going to be in school here. I need to be here on the the important days for them, mm -hmm. the important the important birthdays and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and then I don't take things in, in the really important. So all the milestones okay. and things, I'm always yeah. there, oh, um, okay. and I've I've been able to. Um, to muscle my way uh, in certain times, but then other times, you know, like one one time I was supposed to uh, to do a uh, a show uh, where it was going to be a very uh, the highest paying gig of my entire life and uh, huge huge production, um, but they didn't want to let me go for four and a half months because the director didn't allow anyone to leave, and I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm I'm I need to go home. And they're like, well, you'll never sing in this house again. I was like, okay, nice knowing you. And, but guess what? <laughs> guess what? A year and a half later, they kind of forgot and they needed me. It's funny um, how that that's happens, what usually happens. It? Yeah, it's weird. Sometimes that happens. Hmm. It's happened mm. three or four times a couple of, you know, like mm. where you get blacklisted, you know, you'll, you'll occasionally have that, but then, you know, people don't realize that if you if you're in the business for 10 years like i mean now i've been here in europe basically singing my my big debut was in 2005 so it's almost you know 18 years um when i sing uh Teatro and carlo and uh i've seen four administrations uh come and go in la scala you know i've seen four in vienna you know you just mm -hmm. you see you, you see all out. these <laughs> different yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you just Hold see on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just see you you just realize okay, well, that's not the right time for me, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have to look for an alternative, you know. It's and it's that that's the thing is constantly looking for alternatives, and realizing that um, you don't have to be married to one one country or one uh, one uh, specific place, uh, and that's the nomadic life that we have. And if you wanna if you wanna have a more stable life, like a um, fest life was not for me. I felt like it was high school, mm -hmm. and um, it was stagnant, and I couldn't I couldn't stand like the the feeling that I had when I was in fest because I was in Deutsche Oper uh, Berlin for almost well it was a year and a half. Um, mm -hmm. But I I couldn't stand that that feeling. Um, 
I was going through divorce at the time too, so that didn't help. Yeah, I'm drinking way too much, box, so, you know. So, no, I you know, as, yeah, I really as, don't. Yeah. <laughs> as fast they would say, well, you yeah. know, here in this book it says you're a tenor and you're supposed to sing all these roles, but you'd be like, well, that one doesn't fit me and that one doesn't yeah. fit me. So yeah, I could exactly. see that being a right fit for you anyway. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, one of the things that I wanted to, my baritone album that I, that I made, I originally, like, I really tried to convince them that they wouldn't let me uh, do it. I wanted to, uh, I had two different names in mind. One was going to be called Fuck This or What the Fuck. Um, and neither of them, they just wouldn't let me do it. That's it never, I, it was yeah, but so you good. want a younger generation? Like that's that's going <laughs> to speak to them more than, you know? I, know. I know. That's what I was showing them all the marketing. They're like, no, 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 we can't do this. So eventually I will do that. And I'm going to sing like, you know, like uh, I'll, I'll sing some counter tenor and some bass and some, you know, that can, yeah. I love, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> What's next? Like what, what roles or what direction do you see yourself going in? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that's the interesting thing is that more and more, um, as I was talking about, uh, before, the voice is getting a little darker, and it's easier to sing Verdi and um, and and specifically Wagner. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Wagner was a bel cantist, and the way that he wrote, um, and within his within his markings, uh, you can only find um, uh, specifically uh, bel canto markings within his within his writings. He was an avid avid fan of like Halevi. And um, and Bellini, huge fan of Bellini, um, and you know he really you can hear it in the lines, and you can hear it in when you actually look at the writing the way that he did. And so, mm -hmm. to me, I would like to get. Um, I'm I've been offered a bunch of Wagner in the in the years to come, but I'm treading lightly, doing one one possibly two a year. Um, like this year, I've got um, my first Lohengrin in uh, Strasbourg. Mm -hmm. Which is a smaller, smaller theater to feel it, to feel it. Uh, you know how how this is going to feel because it's more of a bel canto, and then also uh, Erich in uh, um, Der Fliegende Holländer in Hamburg. So uh, yeah, more more Wagner. But the thing is, is that I always want to go back and forth to keep the voice flexible because I found myself like when I was singing. As I got older, when I was singing only bel canto, I was I was not using my full instrument. I really wasn't uh, mm -hmm. because in Europe, a lot of times when you're singing bel canto, um, they want it to be really light and and yeah, precious. exactly. I call Which, it precious you know, singing. Yeah, I could do that mm -hmm. when I was younger, but now the more precious I try to make it, it's like ah, Kermit the Frog. It, you know, oh, it, it, I can't do oh. it. No, but it's you know, it's, it's really funny. Um, I'm doing the, the turn dot here now, and I warm up with Ana Bolena. I warm yeah. up. Oh, yeah. I'll go to agree to me. And yeah. people walking by the hallways, I've had the actually chorus members knock on the door going, Sandra, is that you? <laughs> you know, you have True. to yeah. keep that, yep. that. That I mean, Carrie and I, we were talking about that. She just did Tosca in, in Toronto, you know, and, and to oh, keep great. that buoyancy. In yeah. the voice when you're singing this heavier stuff, I think is so important. So good on you. Precisely, because yeah. if you look at all of the singers, all of the singers up until, I would say, I mean, even the 50s and 60s, these um, these really meaty voices that we look at, uh, you know, maybe an exception would be Leontine Price. You know, she didn't really sing bel canto, but I mean, she sang in a bel canto style. But like, yeah. that's that's the great thing is that when you listen to people like Eleanor Staber and and people that had these just great voices they were also singing bel canto i mean same thing with caruso and all of these huge huge voices they might not have only uh, uh sung bel canto but they did keep it in the repertoire to keep it uh fresh and like lauritz melchior and some of the biggest wagnerians they always sing operetta you know uh to keep it keep it fun and fresh and not just always sticking to this Oh, bad habits, you know, because yeah. as you get older, as, as you, you know, every single day is a, it's a different animal trying to figure out your voice because of hormone changes or because of um, the, the lack of sleep and um, right. for, for that we have in this business. Mm -hmm. So it gets, it gets to a point to where we know what our instrument is uh, kind of going to do, but it's going to be different pretty much every day. And it's a, it's just this adjustment. And as you get mm -hmm. older, that, 
you have to constantly adjust and just trust. <laughs> then, um, oh, sorry. I have a question for you about the Wagner and, and mainly yeah. I'm probably asking this for myself. Um, yeah. Because Wagner to me, if you walk into that realm and you're a voice like yours or you're a voice like mine, where people are like, we hear this, we hear this, we want to, but for me, there's okay yes can I sing this but what concerns me now based on what I've seen happen to other friends of mine that have walked into Wagner is who's in the pit because yep. if somebody is in the pit that a doesn't really know this rep or b just lets it rip then that doesn't set a voice like mine up for success in this repertoire because I'll be buried I mean there's just yeah if I oh, sing absolutely. that bel canto style, which I've been advised to do, then yep. and sing it in my voice, uh, I it's a little scary. So is part of your like Lohengrin and, and the other one you were talking about, is that mm -hmm. a, a knowledge of who's actually going to be in the pit to help you realize this goal? That and it's, yeah, it's being, being very uh, open with the, the people that are that are casting me and wanting wanting me to sing certain things you know i mean because even three years ago i was asked to do like valkyrie and and uh tristan because people heard me sing like this you know uh idomeneo and these kind of things right. and they're like whoa wow whoa. you got that and mm -hmm. i was like yeah that's the easiest place for me to sing mm -hmm. but it's a it's it's a different beast when you have a, a person who doesn't really know how to conduct Wagner and actually do, yes. do it as written, right. you know, and, and so when someone's out offering me or talking to me about doing a really large uh, orchestration, like with Wagner, um, uh, I'll talk to them and be like, who's the, who's the conductor? You do realize I'm going to still be singing in the bel canto. I'm not going to be barking. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get that from me. And mm -hmm. um, the, you know, I, I think, I think also a lot of times people, People that do go into Wagner, um, they uh, they 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 do it in in a certain mentality of like, well, I heard I've got to sing like this, uh, mm -hmm, without yeah. actually looking what Wagner wrote. Like, there are three times more pianos than there are fortes. Thank you, know? you. <laughs> thank you. Oh my and, god! Um, you have to have the voice, but you have to you you have to really do research and understand. Mm -hmm. The house that you're singing in and and what's funny too is like there are some pieces that mozart and handel that if you have the wrong person in the pit you're i don't care how big your voice is you're not gonna you're not gonna get absolutely. over that orchestra absolutely. you know and depending on if they're on stage with you or how they've staged it if you're way in the back somewhere and it's just mm -hmm. terrible staging mm -hmm. um uh or if it, they it's don't just breathe with you. to me oh, that, yeah. that's, oh, yeah. that's the biggest problem with conductors is if yeah. you're if you're wailing away on stage and then they're like don't give you enough time just to exhale and inhale thank it's, you it, i'm yeah. sorry but yeah well, don't be sorry do. it's the truth <laughs> and if you don't understand singing then you know i'm sorry don't conduct opera yeah yeah well i, I think i think another big a big part of it is that um it, it all started happening i really see the demise and um in in this interpretation actually starting during uh, around it's a societal thing because i always find that opera is a uh, um, is a reflection of society a and mm -hmm. the fox system and all of that kind of stuff people don't realize that it really started happening exactly when the science um became the new religion um in in the world in the mid 18 uh, 1800s everyone was categorizing every single thing and to to expound on that is that when when people started um, really meticulously writing out their notation rather than um, relying on tradition and understanding and interpretation of line and and bel canto practice. Mm -hmm. um, people started looking at at uh, uh, you know a, a quarter note as singing. I'm going to sing quarter note and then here's an eighth note and without realizing that's that's a quarter note in context with an eighth that's coming over there and in context with the entire phrase. And people and conductors still, still look at at things like a mathematical uh, problem, which is part of it. Uh, but you you didn't you didn't you got to have heart and soul in there too, you know. <laughs> I know the worst. The worst is those doing Puccini. Sorry, because Puccini. Oh, I know. I know. Side of the lines, and when you have a conductor that doesn't know how to do that, I mean, you just you're like, can I go home? 
I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to zip Thanks. my trap right now because I could get myself in <laughs> so much trouble. Yeah, you, be you better not. Oh, by the way, I love your hair in the new production. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And then was that, go, sorry, was I not supposed to say anything? When, no, when oh, this I airs, I can I put horrible. up a picture of that? No, there was a what was that social media post where somebody was like some made fun of the whole costumes oh. of that whole show? Yeah, yeah. yeah Piotr's it did, did kind of kinda look like you're you were straining spaghetti uh, a little bit with the with <laughs> Oh, I'm telling you, like they need to pay for my chiropractor after all those head movements that I do. It's like oh, I didn't even think. Of, is it heavy there? I mean, are you? Oh God! No, 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 no. It's not heavy, but it's, it's like... just all the. Uh. What, you, um, what's his name? What you talking about, Willis? That's what I think about. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> um, didn't didn't Piotr have like a cape? Wasn't he like a superhero? Was there... he was a superhero? Yeah, superhero. All in blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm a bumblebee. Why do I keep oh, getting these oh, things? Oh, that's what you are. You're a that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm what the what queen bee. Queen bee. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah because uh, there's no there's no bee in the word subtle apparently. Uh, uh, oh, that. I, and the, I mean, I just get these productions that, and then I have that lovely puppet in the Aida in Paris. I, I that one wins though. Actually. Oh, baby, I know. Oh, yeah, I know. I, that's see, that's another thing. I mean, it's an interesting thing because I've been very fortunate to only be in a part of two productions where I really didn't didn't like the production. Um, and I really, part lucky of it it's is only been two. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah. I'm very, I'm very, that's very insane. lucky. But one of the big reasons also is that I'm willing to uh, turn things down and be blackballed. I mean, I've been blackballed by four different people uh, that said, because I didn't, I was like, I, I think you're an interesting artist, but I cannot do this, what you do. I don't believe in this vision. So I'm, you know, you can fire me if you want. Um, and it's happened four different times, but guess what? After a few years, they forget, you know, I wish more singers were like you, Michael. Yeah, I really do. Stand up for know. what they believe in, and but you know, be be true to yourself, and that is something to be said in this business. So, honestly. yeah. Oh, thank you. But that's, I mean, that's. I think that's the only way that you can actually make a career because, you know, when we all get in, we're we're like we have our our idols and the people that we we look up to and want to emulate, and you might be able to get away with that for a couple of months or even a couple of years, but then, if you if you aren't able to integrate and make your own career, uh, and figure out your way in this crazy ocean of the, of the opera, you're not going to make it. You know, no one's going to give you a career, and people think that like man, if I just, if I get this one role in this house, I'm going to make it I'm like, no, no, you aren't. You have to make it continuously yeah. for years and years and years and years. You know, you can let up after 15 to 20 years. And, but, oh, then, but even by then, 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 then you're they like, start saying, oh, yeah. well, they're old or, oh, they're losing Ex their exactly, voice. Exactly. Oh, oh, no. nah, 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 nah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can, you can let up just a hair, but then you can, you know, have, uh, have yeah. a situation to where you can you can actually have a little bit of power and talk to people if you want to uh and be like hey this is not uh this is not right what you said about me you know um but i don't think i, I don't see a reason in picking fights all of the time you know and no. that's the biggest thing is that choosing 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 your battles that's a huge right. part of what we what we do um in our career that a lot of younger people don't realize that I mean, of course, you don't want to you don't want to get stepped on um, and you want to stay stand up for yourself. But um, there is something to be said for doing doing jobs that you don't really want to do uh, uh, for for a lot less money than you want to, because I always saw it as an opportunity when I was younger, um, because, like I said, I sang I sang, gosh, I sang in all of these. So to give you an idea. When I lived in Vienna um, uh, 20 years ago, I moved there or thereabouts um I, I i just had to pay the rent so i sang for these uh, these operetta concerts and i literally did get paid 50 dollars a night for doing four arias three duets um and two two uh um uh two uh, ensembles Ensemble. 50 dollars for that um and mm -hmm. that's in you know three different languages and stuff and so hey i was able to pay it. but 
those people that were working in it became uh, the people that started working in other houses. And then they started saying, there's this good singer who we sang with one time. It's like, oh yeah, oh, that's that guy. And it's just the connection and the network that you have to start to make. And yeah. and it's different everywhere. And the, the funny thing is, is that as you guys have probably noticed that they're all different worlds. Um, like you can be famous in Europe and then come to the States and like never heard of you and mm -hmm. vice versa. I've yeah. had friends that were very big, made it big as younger artists sing at the Met, San Francisco. They come over to Germany you're like, and? never heard of you you know yep. like yep. i mean well that we remember interviewing gregory um gregory conde yeah oh, yeah and, and like huge, huge career in europe and then over here it's like crickets i mean and you're mm -hmm. like, understand this it's insane yeah they're well there's it's they're just different uh, administrations different beasts and the fortunate thing that i had um was that i got into all of those little uh niches you know i went to rossini mm -hmm. um the which I always, like I said, um, the virtue of being an outsider is something I always talk about. And I started singing Italian and German, Germany. Uh, then I started singing German in Italy. <laughs> then I sang Italian in France. Um, yeah. Because guess what? If you're not German, you're not going to be able to compete with their German. And yeah. their, uh, and if you're not Italian, you're not going to be able to compete with the Italians. Mm -hmm. Same thing, French. So it takes a while for you to figure out your way, but then you start to notice that you start to make it when you're getting hired to sing French in France, Italian in Italy, you know, yeah. <laughs> German in Germany. Yeah. And so that's, that, it's, it's just, very true. Yeah, just being flexible and trying to, trying to realize that if, if you're going to do this, um, it's going to be a long haul, you know, but like, again, there's no greater, greater job in the entire world because we're literally paid to to open people's minds and hearts and look at the world in a different way and to inspire and like I can't tell you how great it is you all know when someone comes up to you and they just said like I I've never seen anything like that you've just changed my life and their tears are running down their cheeks or yeah. you sing you sing in a in a in a show and 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 you have it many times like you know I just lost my father and this meant so so much to me and and oh. and what you did is, you know, I'll never forget it. And you're just yeah. like, what other job can you have that that would affect the the human condition more, you know? And yes, it's it's difficult, but come on, I mean, what are we here for uh, on, on this life? It's to it's to affect others and make it make it a better place from where we where we came onto. And there's no other there's no other profession that you can do as much good. Um, I, th I think in a, um, in a very vocal way, because, you know, I have, I have friends that do nonprofit and charity and they're, they're kicking their ass every single day. They're, they're working with, you know, battered women's or, 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 or people that are in, uh, drug, drug addicts and they're fighting for every single penny and they, nobody can, yeah. they, they don't have any kind of voice. Um, but as a singer, you can go and sing for an, an event and bring in tons of people uh and and help each other that's what we are we're kind of these vessels for change that's what i believe that that we are as as singers and artists you know and what we should be so that's, that's so cool beautiful. and very uplifting and i think i needed to hear that today so thank you for that yeah me oh, it's too. absolutely thank true you. it's absolutely true and it's and it's the it's the hard thing for us to realize because our our world what we do um is, is so it's so ephemeral. Um, and, you know, I, I, I sometimes lament because I used to do construction work. Um, and when I, and during the, uh, um, during the pandemic, you know, for the months that I was home, the only time that I've ever been home for months and 20 years, you know, I, I, uh, I, I had to pay the bills. And so I, I couldn't find any other work because I was technically under contract while it would, you know, every two weeks it would, lose lose a contract okay. and not get paid so i went back to doing construction work um uh for a friend of mine uh and shit it it feels different in your 40s than it did in your 20s <laughs> but Don't you know it, it, a job right yeah exactly i was like it made me so thankful I was like whoo oh it's so much better to be a singer you know um <laughs> you know then laying bricks and like like doing a jackhammer in your 40s and you have to drink Amazing. like six beers just it's to, all like, in perspective yeah. doesn't it like mm -hmm. <laughs> well we don't want to take up too much more to your of your time we just have want to do some quick rapid fire sure. if we can 
Are you ready yeah, for it? Possible. I don't know. I'm very verbose. Oh, so let's no. try. No, no, no. It's okay. We so are we. Okay, before I mean, like, you just kind of blew my mind. Like during the pandemic, you were a fucking construction worker. I mean, well, you and you are Michael Spires. Like you're Michael Spires. Like, this is such an inspiring interview. Like, I am so excited for people to hear this. This is just brilliant. Oh, thank I'm so, you. so thank glad you. I got to talk to you today and meet you. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, you too. Oh, yeah. Okay, rapid yeah. fire. Rapid fire. Okay. Let's rapid do it. Let's fire. Do it. Ready for it? Yep. What is your favorite word? Oh, perspicacious. I think it's pretty interesting. I, I don't know. I, just, I love a lot of different words. Um, oh, gosh, I don't know. No, actually, the funniest and my, one of my favorite words is actually in Serbian. It's called Parzanchichi, and it means little Tarzans, and it's basically dingleberries. Um, yeah. <laughs> See? Told you. It's pretty amazing. Oh, I love that. Yeah, oh, yeah. My God. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. But what is your definition of a dingleberry? <laughs> Very Alchema. Oh, that's true. No. That's true. That's no. That's, yeah, that's because my niece and nephew they were like, "That's not what a dingleberry means." And I'm like, "What do you? What? I grew um, up knowing that a dingleberry was like left yeah. over paper in a certain it's, area. Exactly. Of the house. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What? What? What does that mean now? Something different? Yeah, it's like it's something. It's something. Oh, kids these days, they don't even know potty humor. They, they change all the good potty <laughs> humor. I mean, I think our potty humor from the seventies and eighties was. Just, oh yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. Raw. Okay. Um. I'm a mama mum. Okay. Uh, la, la, la. What movie would you watch on an endless loop? Oh. Boy, that's hard. Um. Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> we, no, it would probably be Waking Life. A lot of people don't know that movie, but it's very philosophical and I love philosophy. But um, it's from Richard Linklater. He did Before Sunrise, Before Sunset. Um, yeah, but it's an amazing, amazing piece. And um, I encourage everybody to um, watch it because um, it's talking about uh, waking life. Like uh, you're not really sure when you're watching the film if it's real or if it's a dream because it's a bunch of vignettes where a person is talking uh, to a bunch of different bunch of different psychologists and different uh, philosophers okay. and it, and Richard Linklater is this amazing director and he got 150 uh, illustrators to illustrate oh. the entire thing by hand Ooh. and so it's this arts art film and it'll it'll mess you up and it's wonderful so I'll just it's, yeah well, it's great it I know what's the name again What's it called? Yeah, waking, waking life. Waking like life. you're waking life or or sleeping life. I love there okay. is the, Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I won't go on. But <laughs> that's on my next. Uh, uh, that's added to the watch list right now. Okay, great. Secret talent. Oh Lord, um, I play guitar for 15 years. I play the trumpet. Um, I play the saxophone. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, I I'm. Uh, I used to be a bodybuilder, so I'm super strong too. That's the other thing. Yeah. Cool. My, I, I hide it under I hide it under a lot of uh, natural insulation, but I'm it works it works on the farm. Like when when we have heavy things to lift, yeah, it's it's good for me. So that's my secret wow. talent. I love that. <laughs> heavy lifting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what's your guilty pleasure? Oh gosh, there's too many of them. I'm such a hedonist. Um, <laughs> oh, I would say, golly, what would it be? Um, man, geez, what, what guilty pleasure? Dang. I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I feel guilty about any of my pleasures. That's the funny right? thing. <laughs> right. I know. I, you know, I just, we you have know, that just, answer too. We've, yeah, yeah. I love that when people are like, I love my bourbon. I don't need to feel guilty. Yeah. About Thank you. Very no, much. exactly. Well, I used to, I, I, I uh, for, for a couple of years, so my wife and three of my friends, uh, we started a, a brewery. So I love, I know everything about beer and I lived in uh, Belgium for uh, almost two years and I kept a blog. I mean, I've, I've had like over a thousand beers, but then I got a whiskey and now I really know a lot about wine and okay. crap and you are basically. You're an interesting man. Just, yeah, I mean, seriously. I don't stop. You have a lot <laughs> going on, dude. That's a lot. Seriously. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so then what's your favorite curse word in any language? Oh, gosh, favorite curse word. Dang, let me think about it. Uh, <laughs> um, I always go language. back to, to, to Turbian. It's so great. It's like, um, 
uh, Yibim okay. Pimata. You know, like it means like, right? it's like, yeah, Yebi say is like fuck you, you know, but but Yebenti Mathar is like motherfucker. Uh or you can say kurva, you know, exactly which means, you know, whore. So bitch, something like that. But I, I just love that I don't know. There's there's so many good I, I once wanted to make a book called How to Offend Almost Everyone in Almost Every Language. Um and and I I because I got friends I was in choirs um, I had friends from all around the world and um, I would ask them the first thing you know I would ask them uh, how how to say their bad words and then do hand gestures and stuff you know and things like that and learn learning those things so mm-hmm. I'm gonna make a bestseller someday mark my words <laughs> okay we'll hope you do it um, if heaven exists what do you want to hear God say as you walk through the pearly gates. <sighs> Good job, bud. Cool. <laughs> Good job, bud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come on in. Mm-hmm. I think we'd agree with that right now. I mean, seriously. And, and I think you might want to hear him say, you can go sleep now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, finally, just, just, why don't you take it easy, man? Take yeah. a nap. Take a nap. <laughs> Yeah. yeah see, I mean, that's, that's the other thing I, I have. a. I mean, that, that's a good advantage. You know, I do have, I, I, I have a bit of insomnia, but um, uh, I've always kind of been like that. I, I typically will sleep between four and a half to maybe sometimes six hours, but getting more than that, it's usually it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, that's that's <clears> like <throat> happening just because of hormones at the moment where you just, like, Oh yeah. 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 At three well, in the morning, and, and you're like, okay, what do I got to do now? Yeah. Let's just stay up. Mm-hmm. Horrible. Well, the interesting thing is that once you start looking at sleep cycles throughout history and, and sleep cycles around other um, areas in the world, mm-hmm. you know, almost everyone went to bed with the, with the, with the sun, and then would, they would get up in the right. twilight hour, at one o'clock to three, and be up playing cards, and then they would take a nap again. So it's the by, you know, cycle and, um, just depends on on you and what you can do and if you're getting deep rest but you know right, totally. it's hard to shut it off sometimes that's the problem with me yeah me too <laughs> that's what drugs are for <laughs> that's what drugs are for <laughs> and on that note <laughs> don't do drugs kid <laughs> drugs are bad <laughs> <laughs> some drugs are awesome though thank you okay <laughs> you guys ask- are fantastic i'm sorry i took it my i was just speaking the whole time mile a minute but i want oh, to no. i loved every minute of this i know everybody that's going to listen to is going to love every minute of this so i'm so grateful that we did this thank you for joining us seriously well, thank you guys this is really 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 fun and i really appreciate both what you guys are doing taking the time to to really you know tell tell the world what what the what our side is as artists um because it's a very different world than people think it is uh Mm -hmm. you know we they see they see us on stage or in in magazines sometimes and you know and then you have to have a certain persona on online but it's it's a very different yeah i mean i kind of quit caring uh, a couple of years ago because i was like i'm just going to do my job and and the big thing is is that a lot of opera singers a lot of us you know we don't realize it, but it's a very small niche community in the world. It's a worldwide niche community. Yeah. And there's only so much you can do. Like you can bust your ass and work 80 to hundred hours a week working on your PR and everything that doesn't exactly translate to, to getting more, more money. Um, no, exactly. Or more, more, more money, more money. No. Or, or more, more more money. Exactly. The one thing that will translate to that is really working on your voice, working on your craft and working on um, uh, your, your personal relationships with, within the people in the industry. And that's one thing that a lot of people forget yeah. is just how much actual uh, humanity is in our industry because they try to think of it as a commodity. And, and what you guys are doing with this, with this podcast, um, this is helping a lot of people. And especially, I know, I know admin people are like, oh, that's their favorite thing to do is to watch watch you guys or, you know, Christian Van Horn and these other people that are doing podcasts, you know, because it's great. I, I really, really nice. appreciate it. And I, and you're, you're inspiring a newer generation of, of younger kids that want to be the same, um, the same as us, these opera singers. So yeah, but good, but good on you. We're not the shiny version that a lot of singers put out on social media. I mean, there's, there's a realness, there's a hardness, there's a, 
an awesomeness. There's all of these wonderful factors instead yeah. of just one picture. And um, yeah. I have these conversations. I mean, they saved me during, I think they saved both of us, honestly, if I can speak for Sandra during the pandemic and then, and then yeah. figuring out how to come back to this because we missed it. And we also felt that these conversations were still so very important, especially yeah. for singers to, to listen to. So um, so here we are. So thanks for being a part of it, really, truly. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you. I've got to run back to rehearsal now. Yep, yep, so. yep. Thank you. Thanks Take for care. your time. Take care. Toy, toy. Good luck with Take everything care. in the future, thanks. guys. Same to you. Love you guys. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.